his swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. <laughs> Join us for Ministry of Defence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there. Hello there. I'm Michelle Jubri. It's six o'clock and this is you talking today. Now strikes. Goodness gracious me. If it's not the bin men, it's the post office. If it's not the post office, it's the trains, the planes, the buses, anything and everything quite now, quite uh, right now at the moment seems to be up for grabs when it comes to strikes. What do we think to this? Do you think that the unions should be able to essentially bring much of the UK's economy to its knees? Or has it all gone a little bit too far? That's what I'm asking you tonight. Also as well, if you've seen my show before, you'll know that I'm quite passionate about shining a light on the unfortunate people that's had side effects from the COVID vaccines. I know millions upon millions of people might well have had these vaccines and all is fine. And that is great. But what about for the people that it went wrong for? Some people have got serious side effects. Some people, very sadly, have even died. But yet it seems that still there's been no payout from the vaccine damage payment scheme for those COVID vaccines. Why not? Coroner's reports have confirmed that that was the cause of death for people. So what on earth are we waiting for? Also, Tom Hanks has said, you remember he played uh, in the film Philadelphia, a gay lawyer. He said that whilst that was well and good then, in this day and age, it probably wouldn't be accepted for a straight man to play a gay person. What do you think to that? Because if you ask me, acting is exactly that. You act something you're not. This world, I wonder, has it gone mad? All that to come, but first, the latest news headlines. Michelle, thank you. Good evening. The top stories on GB News. Downing Street says Boris Johnson may not replace his ethics advisor after Lord Guite unexpectedly quit yesterday. The government's now published his resignation letter and the Prime Minister's response. Well, in his letter, Lord Guite says, I was tasked to offer a view about the government's intention to consider measures which risk a deliberate and purposeful breach of the ministerial code. This request has placed me in an impossible and odious position. The idea that a Prime Minister might, to any degree, be in the business of deliberately breaching his own code, he says, is an affront. And he continues, I can have no part in this. Well, in response, Boris Johnson says he'd been seeking Lord Guite's advice in the national interest protecting a crucial industry. But he's the second ethics advisor to resign under the Prime Minister in three years. Shadow Attorney General Emily Thornbury says it's clear there's an issue at Downing Street. To lose one advisor on ethics may be seen to be unfortunate, but to lose two shows that there is something really rotten at the heart of Downing Street. You know, we don't need a new ethics advisor. What we need is a new prime minister. Well, in other news today, the interest rate is at its highest level in 13 years. The Bank of England set the rate to 1.25%. That's up from 1%. And it's the fifth consecutive hike as the Bank of England tries to reduce inflation. Last month, the central bank warned that could peak above 10% in the autumn, putting additional pressure on household budgets. The head of British Gymnastics has apologised after a damning report found systemic failures in the sport from junior to elite level. The White Review accused the governing body of enabling a toxic culture which put profit ahead of child welfare and failed to listen to athletes' complaints. British Gymnastics says it'll be difficult to restore trust, but it is working to strengthen safeguarding where needed. 
The Oscar-winning actor Kevin Spacey can return to the United States after being granted unconditional bail. In court, the 62-year-old, who's accused of sexually assaulting three men, wasn't asked to enter a plea. He's facing four counts of sexual assault and one count of causing a person to engage in sexual activity without consent. He strenuously denies the allegations against him. Well, as you've been hearing, Downing Street insists the government isn't standing by as rail strikes threaten to cause travel chaos right across Britain next week. Officials say ministers remain close to the negotiations between rail bosses and union leaders. And that comes after the General Secretary of the RMT Union, Mick Lynch, accused the Transport Secretary of focusing on his own political ambitions and issuing disgraceful threats to workers' rights to strike. Grant Shapps, for his part, says the expected three-day walkout by rail staff is an indescribable act of self-harm and will put their jobs at risk. Strikes, all we're going to do is lose even more passengers, lose even more revenue, make further investment in railway uneconomical and potentially lose thousands of railway jobs as well. Well, the RMT union boss Mick Lynch says his members are still hopeful of an agreement ahead of those strikes. We want a settlement and Grant Shapps holds the key to that. He has decided to cut funding uh, both on London Underground and the National Railway Network by up to £4 billion. And he wants our members to bear the brunt of that. Thousands of jobs are under threat. He's saying he's threatening more jobs, but they're already under threat. They want mass redundancies. They want to slash our conditions. And most of our members haven't had a pay rise for two or three years. And lastly, EU leaders have been visiting Ukraine the day before the European Commission's expected to back the country's bid to join the European Union. The German, French, Italian and Romanian leaders met with President Zelensky in Kyiv. They also toured bombed-out buildings in nearby Irpin. The, leader, the leaders are also likely to endorse Ukrainian membership of the EU at a summit next week. You're up to date on TV, online and on your radio via DAB+. You're with GB News, where now it's time for Dubes & Co. Thanks for that, Polly. Well, keeping me company until 7 o'clock tonight. My panel, we've got podcaster James Dellingpole, author and academic Joanna Williams and former editor of Labourlist Peter Edwards. And you know the drill. Good evening to you three, by the way. If you're at home, you know the drill on Jubes and Co, don't you? It's not just about us here in the studio. It's about you at home as well. What is on your mind tonight? What do you think to the stories that we are going to be discussing? And is there anything uh, that you're sitting there thinking, why on earth is she not talking about that? Tell me what's on your mind. You can get in touch with me on email, gbviews at gbnews.uk, or you can tweet me at gbnews or at Michelle Jubes. Don't forget, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, download our app, and if you're just about to go out, you can take me with you in your car. We are on DAB Plus Radio 2. Um, you guys have been getting in touch already. Lots of division on some of the topics that I introduced at the start of the programme when I was asking you, wasn't I, about uh, unions? What do you think to this? Is it all going a bit too far or not? Divided opinions coming in already because Phil says, Michelle, the workers have had enough. Um, fair play to the workers, that's what Phil says. But literally, in the exact same second, Alan wrote in and said, no, we need to control them as Maggie did. I think you mean the unions, not the workers. Uh, I assume you mean the unions. Um, what do you think to this? I'll be coming on to that a little bit later in uh, the programme, but do you think we should be able to have all of these strikes? And it's not just kind of... It, it seems to be everywhere. Planes, trains, you name it. I want your thoughts on that, and that will be coming up very soon. But for now, I want to talk about a topic that's personally very close to my heart. I've covered this previously uh, on a prior show, and I said at that point in time that I would revisit this topic because I think it's hugely important. Because if you or your loved one had been hurt or even died uh, as a result of a side effect from one of the COVID vaccines, you would expect some sort of, I mean, I'm going to start with the basics here, acknowledgement 
I would want an acknowledgement that that was actually the case. Uh, then I would probably want some compensation, some kind of uh, damage payout, whatever you want to give the terminology. Well, how come then in this country, apparently 1,200 claims of deaths and injuries from the COVID vaccines have been made so far under the Vaccine Damage Payment Scheme? And it seems that nothing has yet been paid out. That's despite rulings from coroner's courts saying that the vaccine was the cause of death. Now, I need to be clear here, by the way, because millions of people I know have had these vaccines of their own choice. And, you know, some people have had multiple, multiple vaccines and been absolutely fine. So if you're one of those people, you might be sitting there thinking, well, why is she talking about this? On the, on the whole, it's a safe vaccine. And that's great. If you're one of those people, that's wonderful. You know, high five to you. The reason I talk about this is because I think it's absolutely essential that for those people who had the vaccines and were not uh, OK at the end, you know, they might be seriously harmed in some cases and we know have died in other cases. It's not OK for those people to simply just be ignored and not supported. But it seems to me that that is what's happening. Uh, we have this scheme and the scheme, by the way, wasn't set up purely for the COVID situation. This is something that was set up way before then, but yet it should be supporting people. And in my mind, it isn't, and it's fundamentally wrong. Joanna, where do you stand on this? Well, I think the first to state the obvious is that my sympathies lie entirely with the people who've suffered um, side effects as a result of having taken the vaccine or relatives of people who've died as a result of the vaccine. And, and it's an appalling situation that they've been left in. And, and that's utterly tragic that, that people have lost their lives over this. But as you said, millions of people have taken the vaccine. For millions of people, it's been um, safe and it's actually saved a great deal, a, a, a huge but number of lives. But I'm not talking lives. about that. Um, I'm talking about, nobody will dispute, I mean, you'd be a fool to dispute that people have had the vaccine and it's been fine for people, because it has been fine for people. People have not, you know, there's a, it's a small amount of people that I'm talking about, but mm. for me, the number is irrelevant, because it could be as few as one person has well, died. Of course, these people should receive compensation that they're entitled to. Personally, I suspect the reason why they haven't is not to do with a... a huge conspiracy. I would put it more of a piece with the delays that we experience in, in getting a passport, the delays we experience in getting a driving licence, or the delays that people who have lost a relative are experiencing in getting probate for that relative's estate, which is not to excuse it by any stretch, is not to say that, that this is acceptable, but just to say that because of the um, lockdown and because of the tendency towards working from home now, we We've got delays in so many parts of our lives these days, which are unacceptable and appalling. Um, but I don't think there's anything specific um, about the delays in people getting compensation for the COVID jab that's exceptional um, compared to the delays that people are experiencing in other areas. Every time we have any interaction with the state, it seems to me nowadays, we come up against delays and bureaucracy and um, obstacles put in our way towards us getting what we want. Mm -hmm. Like I say, completely unacceptable. Um, but I don't see how there's anything specific about COVID. I do think we have to be cautious about drawing causal links between um, somebody becoming ill or somebody. No, I'm not. I'm not talking. No, I appreciate that. I'm not that. talking about people randomly making connections. I am talking about there has been specific incidences now of more, multiple people. But I don't even want to get into the numbers in some cases because it's not relevant to me how many people. The fact that there's one person is one too many. There have been situations where coroners have ruled that somebody has died because of the COVID vaccines. You do not, to me, it's a no-brainer. No no, I completely agree, Michelle. And like I say, it's absolutely 100% unacceptable. Um, and people should absolutely get compensation or payments that they are entitled to. Um, like I say, I, I just don't think that it's specifically because of their deaths from COVID that these delays are occurring. Every time we interact with any state institution now, it seems to me, from the NHS through to the courts, through to the passport office, the DVLA, we hit against delays and obstacles and it's completely unacceptable. Yeah, I've got to say, I, it don't wash with me that this is just a standard delay. Uh, Peter, as well, one of the things that upsets me greatly, actually, about this topic is people just seem to be so dismissive 
So when you say, right, I want to talk about vaccine uh, injuries, side effects, harms, whatever people want to call them, that's people call them different things. There's almost like this kind of, you know, why are you talking about that? Millions of people have had it and it's all fine. There's a defensive kind of nature, a dismissiveness towards people that are suffering. Uh, if anyone follows me on Twitter, you will notice that I uh, retweeted something that I saw this morning from uh, John Mason, who's a member of the Scottish Parliament. They were having a conversation on Twitter last night. They were talking about side effects, people not being supported, uh, etc. And it was kind of a thread. And if you want to see the details and the context, the full context, etc., et please do. You can see it on my Twitter account, at Michelle Jubes. Uh, as always, um, I've invited John onto this show previously. If he ever wants to come and talk to me, he's very, very welcome. And as part of this conversation about vaccine um, side effects, he, John was saying, I'm more than happy if someone takes us to court, but so far they haven't. I wonder why not? Because their case is so weak, question mark, and three laughing faces. May I answer? You may answer, please do. OK, so I want to put it in context. I think any, obviously, loss of life that's preventable is a tragedy, and I think we'd all feel uh, empathy with people that have lost loved ones. But I also want to put it in context. 149 million jabs put in arms. There's 1,200... Uh, but I don't, it's irrelevant. With, but let me, if you let me answer just briefly. Go on. So 149 million jabs in arms, just over 1,000 claims. They're not findings of facts, they're just at the claim stage, so we don't know what the outcome is going to be. That's less than 0.1%. I want to support public confidence in the vaccine, not undermine it. And I also looked at some of the links that you circulated today, and some of those about, um, very sadly, people dying after receiving the vaccine, but in not all of those cases has a causal link been established. So well, firstly, I've not circulated any links. I don't know what you're talking about there. When you say I've circulated links, I don't know what you mean. So GB News circulated some reading which referred to people dying or becoming ill after the vaccine, not necessarily because of the vaccine. So there isn't a causal link in all these cases. But with all due respect, I'm not really sure what your point is. Because what I'm talking about is there are situations, I mean, Lisa Shaw will be one where people are very familiar with that name, but there is a list of others, where a coroner has ruled that the cause of death was because of a COVID vaccine. Now, there is, that is cut and dry to me. A coroner who presumably knows what they're talking about, I would assume, has said that this is the situation. What more investigation does yeah, one Yeah, a coroner's need? finding has legal status. Are you able to give an idea of the numbers? The numbers are irrelevant. The numbers are absolutely irrelevant. I can give you some numbers. I if you indeed say your... In terms of public health well, assessments. Well, if, if you want numbers, because, and I'm fascinated to why you think that the number is relevant when what I'm querying is, why haven't payments been made to these people? What you're asking me is, you're, un you're basically suggesting that there's an undermining of the vaccine policy by bringing up this conversation. No, I, mean, I suggested which what, a, I balance, think... a balanced debate. So I'm going to get you some things. I think, yeah, so there's currently 24 deaths registered in England and Wales with the codes, the ICD codes for this. 18 of these deaths have the ICD, it's 10, U12.9 to be specific as the underlying cause. Does that, what does that make you feel? Does that, what I'm relevance is that? I'm going to have to ask you to explain what ICD is. I've just told you, Peter, at the end of the day, right, deaths reported as due to or involving the COVID-19 vaccination are recorded using ICD-10 code. The code is U12.9. There are currently 24 deaths registered in England and Wales with the aligning ICD codes for this. 18 of those deaths have ICD-10, U12.9 as the underlying cause. So my point is, people are dying and have been ruled by a coroner's court of the direct uh, cause of this death being the COVID vaccine, why are they not being paid out under this scheme? Your response to that is, well, X amount of million have had the vaccine and if I do this as a percentage and... Da -da, I don't understand why the number is relevant. The principle is what I'm talking about. I'd say they're both relevant. So I think, I think we've all begun, I'm sure James will begin as well, by acknowledging the yeah, distress it, it, it would cause to bereave families. I think we'd all acknowledge that because any preventable death is a tragedy. But I think public health decisions, when you're dealing with the whole population, it's right to take into account numbers as well. I, I, I still I don't know what your point is. Because, I, what, I mean, I'm going to try one last time because I know I want yeah, to do yeah. it. I'm going to try one last time. What is the relevance of the number of people when I'm asking you about the principle of why are these people not being supported, whether it's one person, 200 people, or a million and two? 
The number for me is irrelevant. It's the principle. If a coroner says that this is what has happened, why are they not being supported by the scheme that is supposed to support them? Well, the scheme is called the Vaccine Damages Payment Scheme is still considering the claims, isn't it, and the coroner's findings? What is there to consider? The coroner has made a ruling, Jim. Have you asked a scheme? Before yeah. I spontaneously combust, let me bring um, up Jim's. Yeah, well, first of all, congratulations to GB News for raising this issue, which has been pretty much covered up by the media for the last two years. The media seems to have acted in cahoots with the government. OK, partly it's been frightened by Ofcom regulations, but, but mainly the media has been bribed to push these, these experimental gene therapies, which, which have been uh, uh, rushed out, which haven't been, been given proper safety testing. And I find it extraordinary, given that everyone in the country now knows somebody who has suffered vaccine injuries of some kind. I know people who've lost relatives. I know people who've, who've, who've suffered all manner of, you know, myocarditis and stuff. And two out of three panellists are still de defending the government's line. Obviously, uh, these people need to be um, compensated for the, for the damage that's been done to them by the vaccines that, in many cases, they were coerced into taking. I had somebody on the podcast the other day, um, a, a guy called Alex Mitchell, who was a, 50, who was a 57 year old scaffolder. He was absolutely healthy. Uh, no medical problems whatsoever. He had the AstraZeneca vaccine. They're not, they're not even vaccines. Within, within four days, he suffered blood clots and had to go in for emergency surgery. The, the surgical team thought he was going to die. In the end, he, he, he survived just. A week later, he had to have a leg amputated. I spoke to him about the vaccine comp compensation, which, is, as you know, you get a maximum of £120,000. Imagine that, for losing your leg, the maximum you can get is £120,000. And he, he told me two particularly shocking things. One is that, actually, uh, he was almost ineligible for the full payment. You've got to have been shown to have suffered 60% um, uh, uh, loss uh, to, to, to qualify for the full amount. Uh, and the second thing was, it, he confirmed that nobody has been compensated. I suspect there is a reluctance on the part of the state to pay out because they know that by paying out the, the, these sums, it, it's going to uh, crystallise in many people's minds that vaccine injury is a problem and it isn't going to go away. Can I, I think just... you're becoming very conspiratorial there, James. I mean, you're predicting oh, right. crystal you. ball gazing about what may or may not be going on. In These are real life. people. Oh, absolutely. Are you just but trying to dismiss them and act as the government spokes not. spokeswoman? No, 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 not for well, it sounds second. like it. And I'm not a government spokesperson, and I've never been accused of that before A useful in my idiot, life. maybe. Uh, well, let's let Joanna speak, oh, if that's right. Um, what I was going to say was that you're, you're, you seem to be second-guessing what's in the mind of the people who are running this compensation claim. You seem to be suggesting that they're deliberately withholding pay because in, if they did pay out, it would be somehow an admission of guilt or it would crystallise something in the public sphere. I'm saying it's outrageous that these payments haven't been made, but I'm saying it's cock-up rather than conspiracy, because as soon as we go down the path of saying it's conspiracy, uh, you know, you're, you're really uh, opening up all kinds of suggestions. Um, you know, the, I think you're going down a very dangerous path in saying that. I think it's possible to say people who've died or people who've been injured should be compensated without bringing in a whole heap of alarmism about the vaccine. So you're talking about a dangerous path. I think a lot more dangerous a path is if the government is forcing people, pretty much, coercing people into taking experimental gene therapy, which we know is damaging. Right. Can I... I, just, I do just want to hop in on a couple of things, because... Um... James is expressing his personal opinions, which you're absolutely entitled to do. I do want to kind of just push back slightly on a couple of bits, because you said pretty much everyone will know someone that's got this situation. And actually, I suspect that's not the case, because there have been about, I think it's about 150 million doses of this vaccine given. And, you know, you tell me uh, at home, I might be speaking for you, do you know someone that's had an adverse uh, reaction to this vaccine? James says you think that pretty much everyone knows someone. I, I'm not sure that that's quite correct. Uh, and when you say it's not a vaccine, it is, by a technical definition, a vaccine. You'll have your opinions about how effective it is or it isn't, and that's kind of a different thing. But And also, when you say it's experimental, I mean, I do have to also point out that it has gone through a variety of different... Emergency things. experimental legislation. Well, it, it's, it, it was... It was it it's was still in stage, stage three trial phase. Come yeah, on. But, but that's I a do, fact. I do need to be kind of... I do need to make sure that what we're kind of 
transmitting is kind of as accurate as it can possibly be. Um, and, you know, it has been uh, given approvals, authorization, whether it's... Emergency. Under emer yeah, under an emergency scheme initially, many people will push back and say, actually, that was the only scheme available at the time because of the speed in which they had to get this to market. So I do want to just make sure that we're kind of being as accurate as we possibly can be. Um, I, I do think, though, James, that something that you say is about there'll be a nervousness, a slight nervousness from the government that when you concede that actually there has been harm caused, will that dent public confidence? And I think, Peter, this is the kind of angle that you're coming at it from, from the public confidence perspective in these uh, vaccines, etc. It's for the government's, I would suggest, uh, the government's kind of mindset that they want people to feel that these vaccines are safe and if people are, feel that they want to take them, then they want to feel reassured in the safety of them doing that, which is perhaps why you're coming at me with these figures. But I just feel so strongly about uh, the way that these people have been... I think it's quite mistreated, actually. Uh, many of them have been disbelieved. Uh, many of them have been called names. Um, they still, I don't believe... And I was hoping to talk uh, to one, and hopefully... Yeah. In fact, actually, let me just kind of... Yeah, I'll keep my, my thoughts just quiet for now because joining me is Vicky Spitt. Uh, she lost her partner, Zion, after a rare AstraZeneca vaccine reaction. I don't know if you've been able to hear uh, any of that conversation that we've just been having. I know uh, Zion's death certificate actually lists the AstraZeneca vaccine as the cause of death. Uh, as I understand it, replied uh, to the it's, scheme. It's uh, Zion. Oh, Zion, Not sorry, Zion. I do apologise for that. I was I was mistold the pronunciation. I apologise. Uh, just tell us briefly Zion. your story. Well, um, Zion got the vaccine on the 5th of June last year. He got it because he believed, as we all did at the time, that it was safe and it would prevent him catching and spreading COVID. Zion was in exceptionally good health. He was 48 years old. He exercised every single day. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He ate very cleanly. And um, two weeks after the vaccine, he was dead. The sole cause of it was the vaccine. Um, there were no other underlying conditions or no health issues whatsoever. And, and that was confirmed was... by a coroner, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, and, uh, and as I understand it, you'd apply, you've applied to the vaccine damage payment scheme. And I mean, I think this was back in June last year, wasn't it? That's right, yes. And what's the status of that claim? I don't know. Um, I was told about 10 weeks ago that they would be starting to assess claims. You know, bearing in mind, I put my claim in in June over a year ago now at this point, and they didn't request medical records until I think March this year. Um, I don't know why it took them so long. But, uh, yeah, I was told that my claim would be one of the first ones to be assessed and that it would take at least 12 weeks, maybe longer. They didn't know. And I have emailed them a couple of days ago to ask for an update on this to see if 12 weeks is still the case. And I haven't heard anything back yet. And I mean, I guess uh, I might be putting words into your mouth, but... Um... I guess it's probably even not even so much about the money as more the principle. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. He died doing what he believed was the right thing to do. What we were told was safe, what we were told would prevent you catching and spreading COVID. As it turns out, it doesn't prevent you catching or spreading COVID. And it kills people. I mean, I know obviously there are millions of people who haven't been killed or injured by it, but then there are thousands of us who have. And the fact of the matter is, because of the embargo on talking about it, we are treated as if we are insane. We are called names, as you said. I've been told that I'm trying to become famous from doing this. You know, like, Zeon died from the vaccine and I'm trying to become famous. No, I'm, I'm trying to help all the people who've been bereaved and injured who don't have the energy to fight for justice get get the help that they need. Now, there are people who have been left completely disabled, who can't work, whose partners are now left full-time carers. These people have had to spend money fixing up their homes to um, enable them to live in them with their disabilities. And these people haven't had a penny. I mean, yeah. people, you know, a year on, people are going to lose their homes. Vicky, I, I am so, firstly so sorry for your loss. Uh, and secondly, as you will probably be aware by now, GB News, we're passionate uh, about this topic and I will continue uh, shining a light on this, revisiting this issue because I do passionately believe that you guys need to be believed 
recognised and supported. And we'll try, uh, I certainly as a presenter, will try my best to keep shining a light on this. Uh, but for now, thank you very much uh, for your time you. this evening. See, Peter, and that for me is what this is all about. I think it's, it's not even about the numbers for me, and I get what you say about the numbers. It's about even if it's one person, if someone has had this experience, they must be supported. This is, it's such a black and white area for me. There's no gray area at all. And I genuinely believe that we're failing these people. And I think it's heartbreaking. I think it really is heartbreaking. Uh, right, we're gonna take a quick break. I'll leave you to ponder your thoughts on that one. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, gbviews at gbnews.uk is the email. I'll have some of your reaction to that story in just a couple of minutes. And I also wanna to talk to you when we come back as well about strikes. I told you at the start of the program, uh, people were in touch with me, divided opinions. Where do you sit with this? Do you back the unions and think that this is all kind of uh, well and good and go for it or? not. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you and we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubry. Lots of uh, feedback on that last topic coming in. Uh, quite a mixed reaction to it, actually. Some people are asking, well, why would there even need to be a vaccine damage payment scheme if uh, these vaccines were as safe as we were led to believe? But I do have to say that this scheme was set up way in advance of uh, any COVID situation. I think it was set up in about 1979, if my uh, thoughts kind of serve me correctly. Uh, lots of people are agreeing with the sentiment that I have, which is it's not about statistics. It's about the principle. I mean, you just heard one story there and there are indeed uh, several others that we could have called upon. And I just find it tragic. I think it's so sad. And I've seen many of these people being disbelieved, being called names and undermined. And as I say, it's all well and good. And I'm happy for you if you had many vaccines and you're all safe and well, that's wonderful. And that is, of course, the majority. It's the, it's the minority that I think we all should kind of be wanting to come together and supporting. Uh, right, let's talk strikes, shall we? Where do you stand on this one? Because you will know by now that this strike's kind of been talked about uh, in so many different sectors, isn't it? Uh, whether we've got bin workers, it's across the airlines, trains, Eurostars, uh, cancelled services, etc. So getting involved uh, in this topic with me tonight, my panel, a reminder in case you've just joined us, we've got podcaster James Dellingpole, author and academic Joanna Williams, and the former editor of Labourless, Peter Edwards. 
Hello, you three. Hello. Hello. You're getting uh, lots of reaction, you three, already on the email. So I want to talk strikes. I think I'll start with you, Peter, on this one. Uh, I can get into all the different uh, semantics of where and what and all the rest of it, but let me just start initially with the principle again. Do you think that uh, the unions have got perhaps too much power when it comes to the running, the smooth running of this country? No. There's many fewer people in the unions than 30 years ago. I'm a trade union to go to the heart of the dispute uh, when rail workers face a real terms pay cut of 10%. It's entirely reasonable that they consider withdrawing their labour while a skeleton service continues to operate on the railways. So I have every sympathy for my comrades on the railways, even though I'd prefer a strike didn't go ahead. So do you, so, because I think there's a bit of divide, isn't there, certainly within some of the Labour Party people and conversations that I've seen, do you fully support them? So, I mean, we're talking quite a lot of potential strikes, aren't we? Uh, it's not just across one group, one company, one sector. We have the potential to see this country essentially brought to its knees. Well, well I don't think that's the case because, as I said, a service is going to continue to run every day uh, just for slightly shorter hours. So I don't think it's being brought to the knees. And I actually think, and I know you're obviously just putting the question, but I think Conservative ministers have seen a dispute and they've heightened the dispute with lots of inflammatory rhetoric. They were called bullies by one trade union general secretary rather than trying to bring the sides together. If there's a dispute between rail workers and passengers, surely we should try and ameliorate that dispute rather than whip it up in the name of a culture war. I've got to say, you say that you've seen some of the trade union bosses call the government bullies. I think there'll be a lot of people that say that it's the trade unions that are the bullies. Why do you say that then? What, what do you because if I, think back to, if I think back to, for example, uh, COVID, we've just been talking about COVID to some extent, but if I think about things like the schools in COVID, I think that the way that the unions were pushing back and pushing back and pushing back and the knock-on effect that that had to the children... I think it was wrong. Well, I went actually. to school by train when I was a child, and if there's slightly. No, I'm talking about the teachers being in in classrooms in COVID. I'm talking about things like that. I think that actually there's a balance, and yes, I think that if you're a worker, you should be entitled to fair pay, fair conditions, and all the rest of it. You know, who wouldn't think that? Point one. But I also think there's a balance between the people that you're there to represent and the broader economy, the broader public. I do. That's my view. What's your view on it, James? Um. Loads of people, Peter, have had real-term pay cuts in the last two years. Get real. People in the private sector have probably lost a lot more. Businesses have been destroyed because of the COVID nonsense. And you're, and you're asking us to feel for our hearts to bleed for public sector workers who are holding the country to ransom with rail strikes. But They're not in the public sector. OK. I still have no sympathy for them. OK, but they are in the private sector. OK. Uh, Joanna, where are you? Well, unbelievably, I mean, who'd have thought this when Peter and I were on this show together uh, a couple of months back? But I'm with Peter on this. I am supporting uh, these you too. strikers. You sat next to each other. You know, if we were skilled, we're loving to going on tonight. Around Is this the balance? Yeah, but, two lefties and one vaguely right -wing Well, again, I mean, James, you're, you're hitting me with an awful lot of labels I've not been hit with for a long time tonight. And I just judge as I, as I see. Several decades before I've been called a lefty. Um, but I, I think, you know, maybe I'm just showing my age here, but I think, to judging by a lot of the commentary that we've had over the past few weeks since this rail strike was announced, it's like people have forgotten that strikes are disruptive. It's like the whole point of a strike is that it causes disruption. And I think it's a sign of the times of, of how few strikes we actually have in this country, that people are kind of reacting with shock horror that, that this is going to cause some disruption. But, but I actually think, you know, workers are right to demand a decent standard of living. So maybe I'm being a bit sentimental here, but my dad was a railway man and my dad was a member of a national union of railway men back in the day. And uh, I'm very proud of the fact that he was a member of the union. I'm very proud of the fact that he went on strike and wanted a better standard of living for his family. Uh, he wanted a decent wage so that he could feed his kids and support his family. And it was only through 
binding together with his colleagues, with his comrades, and actually going on strike, that he was able to get those better pay and conditions. And, and I think the point is that this is disruptive in the short term. But actually, if we all just hold our hands up in the air and say, well, never mind, you know, we'll, we'll accept a 10% pay cut, all of us across the board, you know, we just end up with everybody being more impoverished. And it takes some people to actually stand up and hold the line here and say, you know, this is not good enough. We're not prepared to accept becoming poorer. Why should we, as a nation, suffer a 10% Pay cut. We didn't ask for lockdown. I didn't ask for lockdown. I was I was massively opposed to lockdown. You know, I haven't asked for the economy to be paused for two years. I didn't ask to have to deal with the consequences of that. So why should I now be expected to suck up a 10% cut in my living standards? Off the back of that, I, I'm not a railway man. I'm going to be affected by the disruption. But I, I support them because I recognise it might pay off in a better standard of living for me or for my children in years to come. Um, and by the way, Peter, on your public v private sector, I thought PCS, that's a, a public sector. So as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought it was a mixture of private sector and public sector strikes, the unions. It's predominantly private sector because we're talking about train operating companies, but obviously t both TfL or TfL is essentially part of local government in London and Network Rail is a kind of arm's length body. But I could talk about this all day, but I suspect we've got other topics to get to. Yeah, and just to be clear, by the way, because this is the point that I wanted to land, it's not just the rail network, that's not. So we're in a situation where we've got a bit of uh, rail stuff we've just been talking about. British Airways checking staff, they're currently being balloted. Ryanair, EasyJet, they've held uh, strikes already. Uh, the largest civil service union, PCS, they're striking for three days from the 15th to the 17th overcuts. BT workers, who are part of the CWU, they're trying to get their members on a ballot. Uh, that ballot will be opening in... in and what, 15th of June? When's that? Oh, that was yesterday. I was going to say pretty much now. So this is, for me, it's everywhere now. It's pretty much, this has got tentacles everywhere. And I guess, Peter, the point I'm trying to make is, don't you think there's a point where it's kind of like, OK, enough? No. You've got to balance, you've got to balance the needs of your workers with the broader economy, the impact on the broader economy. Uh, so... Ballot, that doesn't mean a strike is going ahead. It means there's a democratic function in the trade union, which I think is a positive thing. And obviously, the mistakes 40 years ago that uh, one union leader made was uh, having a strike uh, without a ballot. So I think having a ballot is entirely reasonable. It allows um, all shades of opinion to be taken into account. And as a trade union member, I've been on the kind of the, the winning side and the losing side in terms of those votes. Um, but ultimately, we don't want strikes to go ahead. But as a last resort, it's reasonable to put the option on the table. Do you think? Do you think that the, when you say we don't want strikes to go ahead, do you I, think yeah. that's do you think that's the case for all and for everyone? Well, no, I can't speak for everyone, but having been on strike myself as a trade unionist and um, lost pay as a result of that, and stood out with my colleagues whose pay and pensions was being cut, no one wants to end up in that situation. No one wants to end up well, it's summer now, but standing in the rain in a dispute, losing pay, having to cut their living standards and their pension at risk. People would rather be doing a job that they generally enjoy and making a contribution to national life. Um, Peter has just emailed in. What would you say to this point? If someone's not happy with their pay and conditions, there's no one stopping them from getting another job. Well, there has to be vacancies and a skill set. And I think we've often talked in here there's about... There's loads of vacancies in this country. In the rail network? I don't know. I'm not a job site. Have a look, and I bet my bottom dollar there is. I bet if I go to a job site now and put put a job into the rail sector, I bet I can find one. The point that Peter is making is, if you've got a job and you're not happy with it, why don't you get a different job? But the only I really power, don't think it's that simple. The only power that working class people have um, who, who are doing jobs like working on the railways, uh, they have very little power individually. It's only by combining their collective um, labour power and withdrawing that that they have any leverage in arguing for better paying conditions, not just on an individual basis for themselves, um, but for all workers across the board. And, and I, I think that's a really, really important thing. And, and if we take that, that right away from people to withdraw their labour in a strike, and, and recognise that part of that is causing disruption, then essentially what we're saying is that working class people uh, are going to be reduced to only um, getting charity, essentially. You only get a pay rise when somebody feels sorry enough for you or feels generous towards you to give you more money or you've got to have like, an individual solution to that problem. I actually think people deserve pay rises and, and if, if when we're, we're faced with this unprecedented crisis in the cost of living, 
people need to be able to argue for more money. Well, there you go. What do you think to all of that? You can get in touch with me, gbviews at gbnews.uk. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'll have some more of your thoughts. Lots of people get in touch on the strikes. Again, quite a divided uh, audience I've got tonight on that one. Uh, let me know your thoughts. As I said, gbviews at gbnews.uk. When we come back, I want to talk to you about this story I find it very peculiar. Tom Hanks. Uh, you remember that film, Philadelphia? Well, he says, in this day and age, he doesn't think he would have been able to afford played that role as a gay lawyer because he is not gay. I found that very weird because isn't the very principle of acting you pretend to be something you're not? Hmm, I'll have, I'll have that and more in a couple of minutes. Coming up on Dan Woodson Tonight with me, Patrick Christie's. As a new poll suggests that only three in ten people believe that trans athletes should compete alongside biological women, why are so many institutions prepared to tear apart women's sport for a vocal minority? Olympic swimmer Sharon Davies weighs in on that and reveals the findings of her very own survey. Plus, should we be more worried about AI becoming sentient? Ex-spook and cyber savant Philip Ingram gives his verdict. And as ever, there's unfiltered opinion from political firebrand Anne Widdicombe and my superstar panel, Conservative commentator Dominique Samuels, former Tory London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey and author and broadcaster Amy Nicole. That's Dan Watson tonight, Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, right here on GB News. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubery. Keeping me company until 7 o'clock tonight, we've got my panel, podcaster James Dellingpole, author and academic Joanna Williams and former editor of Labelist Peter Edwards. Good evening, you three, and welcome if you've just joined us. Nigel Farage will be on at 7 o'clock. Nigel, good evening to you. What have you got coming up? Good evening. 50,000 people have now crossed the English Channel in small boats. All of this after a Brexit referendum and a thumping Tory majority, all on the basis of taking back control and getting Brexit done. I'll be debating tonight with the former boss of Border Force and eminent QC the question, have we taken back control? Because to me, it doesn't feel like it. Mm, well, I'll leave that to my viewers to ponder as well, and I'm sure they'll be in touch with you, uh, Nigel, and let you know what they think. We'll see you at seven.
Right, let's move on, uh, shall we? Lots of you, by the way, getting in touch with that last uh, one, that last topic about strikes, if you missed it. Graham says, what about us pensioners? We want more money, but we can't go on strike. You raise a good point there. Uh, Eric says, oh, did uh, Peter just say that skeleton uh, service is being put on during these strikes, so hopefully it won't impact people too much, he says. If that's the case and we won't realise the impact so much, then be careful what you wish for, because if we can get by on a skeleton service, why don't we stick with it? What do you say to that? Well, passenger numbers are down. That's very sad. I much prefer being in the office to Zoom, even though Zoom's been a great innovation. But I think, actually, if there have been polls done on it. The railways are really popular. Rail nationalisation is really popular. And there's great uh, affection for the railways. And in, in London, it's beyond affection. They're kind of they're at bursting point, if not past it. <laughs> Yeah, another sentiment that's coming through right now is that many people do agree uh, with people's right to strike and support them absolutely, but question, is now the right time, given all of the kind of disruption, etc., that we've just had? We've only just got ourselves reopened again, haven't we? And now this, so... You know, is, can we, is there ever a good time? That's kind of what I would say back to that. Do you ever sit there and say, right, yes, now, today is the day. Let's kind of close down much of the railways and, you know, dabble with bin collections and all the rest of it. Is there, is there ever a day where you sit there and think, yes, today is a good day for that? I don't know. You let me know what you think. Right, let's talk acting, can we? If I say to you, what is an actor, what would you think? To me, the answer is quite simple. It's someone that pretends to be someone that they're not. I always thought that was just a given and that everyone would have had that same kind of sentiment. But Tom Hanks, who you might recall won an Oscar for his portrayal of a gay man living with HRV, uh, basically has now said that in this day and age, he doesn't feel like he would be able to play that role, and rightly so, in his words. Um, but why not? Because isn't that the very principle of acting, James? Yeah, he, well, he was absolutely right. He, he probably would, in the current culture, he probably wouldn't be able to play a, a gay man anymore for the reasons you've just given. But he completely ruined it by saying, and quite right too, as if somehow this was a kind of progressive... Well, it is a progressive mood in, in, in one sense, but, it, like, this was a good thing. It's absolutely not a good thing. I mean, I don't want to be rude about actors. Some of them are my friends, so, Lawrence, forgive me if I'm what I'm about to say. But, but actors have got one job. And it's pretending to be someone they're not. If they're denied even that, what are they paid all that money for? Uh, I, I mean, there are films that could not be made now, Philadelphia, but before that, Lawrence of Arabia, mm. Alec Guinness playing Prince Faisal and sort of blacking up. But he actually did it really well. He was, uh, I don't know whether you've seen that scene. He, was a, he, he, he lends the role dignity and charm. You're asking the, I've not seen hardly anything. I barely even watch anything these days, apart from GB News, of course. Uh, someone has got in touch asking, what about the, the Terminator then? Do people realise that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is not actually, in fact, a real <laughs> robot? Uh, Peter, where do you stand on all this? Well, I think Tom Hanks is a fantastic actor and I think Philadelphia is a fantastic film that's really sensitive and ahead of its time. But, but I don't agree with Tom Hanks on this. And I think it, it comes from very much from good intentions. I, I, I really like Tom Hanks. I think he's uh, got a lot of compassion. But th think about what this would mean. When you say you are someone to come to an audition to play an historical figure like Oscar Wilde, who, who we know was gay, what do you say to someone when they're going for a job? Tell me your sexuality. You can't mm -hmm. say that in other job interviews. So uh, I think... Although Tom Hanks has died from very good intentions, I think it's a completely impractical idea. And it also, it risks sh shutting out more people um, when it was intended to open it, open up and be diverse. And again, are you gonna ban gay actors from playing straight, straight characters? Of course not. Yeah, I just think that the more you, the closer you get, Joanna, to the, the similarities between the person as the actor and then the person as the character, the closer you uh, get in terms of similarities, to me, the more you're taking away the craft of acting. Completely. I mean, I think this is the issue tonight, that you've got unanimity on your panel here because I, I completely agree with everything that everyone said on this so far. I mean, you take this to, to its logical conclusion. Um, we'll all only be able to play ourselves. And, mm. um, you know, I would only be able to play a kind of middle-aged white woman <laughs> straight with children <laughs> from the north of England originally, now in the south. You know, that, that, that's the logical conclusion that, that we take this to. And, and what 
what that means really is the death of acting as a profession, but more importantly, the death of drama, the death of literature, uh, and the end of our capacity to use our imagination, to project, to, to imagine and use empathy, to put ourselves in the role of, of different people, which, which I think is a really important part of acting and drama. You know, it's asking you to imagine and, and put yourself in someone else's shoes. And that's, we used to think that was a, a very progressive thing to do, you know, walk a mile in someone else's shoes to, to feel for that person. Well, James Lee has written in saying this is all nonsense because if you want to depict, for example, a serial killer, Mm. Well, what are you going to do then? You, well, you've, the got to go and, you've got to get into practice. You've got to go out and kill people. It's, it's, just, it's it, like Marathon Man, isn't it? It is it's just absolutely uh, ridiculous. And I can't help but ponder often what is behind this sentiment? Because, like, it's what you say. Yeah. The key interesting point is Tom Hanks. I said Tom then, as though he's my bestie, but Tom <laughs> Hanks. Yeah. Him kind of saying, yeah, rightly so, I, w I wouldn't be able to play it. Well, isn't it interesting that this is the one thing that the, the panel agrees on, and yet we're still discussing it. So, in a way, we've lost the argument because we are doing exactly what they want us to do. That they want to make us the industry want to make, because uh, the Hollywood TV and, uh, industries are all part of the, the brainwashing exercise that, that, that they're designed to kind of um, ruin our, our culture and, and, and weaken our civilization. And they're forcing us to have this argument by, by deliberately doing things that we know are stupid and they know are stupid, but they nevertheless push on with it. You, you think about all the diversity requirements that, that film productions have to have now in order to, to win, a, win an Oscar or an Academy Award. You have to push lots of buttons. You have to have a, a quota of disabled, disabled people, a quota of black people. Most of us don't really care about identity. Uh, we don't obsess about it. If someone is a good actor, that's all that counts. We don't care whether he's, he or she is gay or straight or black or white. What matters is the convincingness of the, of the performance. Mm, I completely agree with you, I have to say. Although, obviously, if I die and you all decide to put on a life story of Michelle Jubilee, please can I request that you get a, a, a Hull girl, actually, <laughs> with an accent like mine. She doesn't need to have blonde hair, because mine's not even real anyway. But, yes, yeah, a nice Hull person to play me, and I'd be very, very, very happy. Uh, lots of you still getting in touch about um, the striking, saying, absolutely, yes, people should be able to fight and fight hard for the pay and conditions that they deserve. Tina has been in touch, saying, Michelle, you are completely irresponsible uh, for having that conversation about the vaccines at the start. She says, how many people would have died if it wasn't for the vaccines? Well, Tina, I say to you, uh, it's not irresponsible at all to talk about uh, people that are not being supported when they have had uh, unfortunate side effects or death because of the vaccine. It's not irresponsible. Irresponsible. It is essential, if you ask me, and I, unfortunately, uh, I can make no apology for that. In fact, on the opposite, I can make a promise to you that I will continue uh, shining a light and having those conversations because in my mind at least it is essential that those people are heard, believed and supported. Have yourselves a fantastic night and I will see you tomorrow. Hello. The fine weather looks set to continue for many areas as we head into Friday. Plenty more sunshine to come and temperatures rising further, turning very hot and humid for much of England and Wales. Cooler in the north, though, with some rain. If we look at the pressure pattern, then you can see high pressure still affecting us at the moment. That's what's keeping it largely dry and fine. But as it pushes its way eastwards, we start to drag up a more southerly flow across the UK, so bringing some very high temperatures indeed across England and Wales. But cooler towards the northwest, and that's thanks to a weather front that's spreading in from the Atlantic. That will continue through Thursday evening and overnight. It's totally quite wet across Scotland. Northern Ireland with a strengthening breeze here. But elsewhere across the UK, aside from just one or two showers, it will be dry, variable amounts of cloud, and quite warm across England and Wales as well. Temperatures in cities not dropping below 15 to 17. Cooler, though, across Scotland and Northern Ireland. So we pick up on that rain then, still affecting much of Scotland and Northern Ireland through Friday morning. Some of that again could be on the heavy side, and that will slowly push its way southeastwards. But for the bulk of England and Wales, look at this, it will be dry, plenty of sunshine, probably more sunshine compared to Thursday. And with a southerly flow of wind, then it's going to